During October's Synod, with the theme of young people, the faith, and vocational discernment, Pope Francis proclaimed seven new saints from every walk of life. Seven new saints and seven great examples for people to follow today. In this special episode, we'll tell you the stories of four examples of heroically lived Christian lives, those of the Roman Pontiff, Pope Paul VI, El Salvadoran Archbishop Oscar Romero, Italian Father Francesco Spinelli, and German religious sister Maria Caterina Casper. Santos es de cernimos e definimos, al santorum catálogo ascribimos, statuenti seos in universa ecclesia, inter santos pia devozioni recoli devere, in nomine patris et fili et spiritus santi. Amen. Jesus is radical. He gives all and he asks all. He gives a love that is total and he asks for an undivided heart. Even today, he gives himself to us as the living bread. Can we give him crumbs in exchange? Jesus is not content. Jesus is not content with a percentage of love. We cannot love him 20 or 50 or 60 percent. It is either all or nothing. All these saints in different contexts put today's word into practice in their lives without lukewarmness, without calculation, with the passion to risk everything and to leave it all behind. Brothers and sisters, may the Lord help us to imitate their example. Pope Paul VI was born as Giovanni Battista Montini, the second of three children, here in the small city of Concesio. His father, Giorgio Montini, was a lawyer member of the Italian Chamber of Deputies and political editor of the Catholic paper Il Cittadino di Brescia. His mother, Giuditta Alghisi, was a member of the local noble families and president of the Brescia chapter of Women's Catholic Action. Giovanni Battista grew up in the faith, and both parents, his mother especially, imbued the children with a love of literature, art, music, philosophy, and political life. Fausto Montini is the son of Ludovico Montini, the elder brother of Giovanni Battista, Fausto says that the two brothers were very close and that his uncle Giovanni was a frequent guest in their house. Ever since I was a child, I sensed that he was a very, very special person. He had a way of looking at you that was penetrating, but not to control you or to scrutinize you, but to try to understand you deep down, even when it came to the smallest of children's issues. If I had a serious problem, especially as an adult, I knew that the surest, most available, and most immediate person to get support from was him. My uncle had a very subtle capacity for irony. He was always ready to pick up on the funny things, always cheerfully and politely, with what you could define as an English sense of humor. He didn't like expensive cassocks, and he would often say at home, when speaking of homilies, that a five-minute one was for the soul, a ten-minute one for the preacher, and that a homily lasting a quarter of an hour was for the devil. That's the kind of person he was. Giovanni was ordained a priest on May the 29th, 1920. After further studies in Rome, he began working in the Holy See Secretariat of State and eventually became a trusted assistant to Cardinal Eugenio Pacelli, the future Pope Pius XII. During the terrible years of World War II, Monsignor Montini helped to lead refugee and relief efforts as well as helping save Jews from death in the gas chambers. In November of 1954, Montini was appointed as Archbishop of Milan and named a cardinal in 1958 by Pope John XXIII. During the conclave in 1963, he was elected Roman Pontiff during the fifth round of voting on June the 21st. 
At home, it wasn't customary to talk about it, although deep down we did have a feeling our uncle could be elected. Then I ran home, turned on the television, and I heard the announcement. It was very emotional. The phone rang and it was my father who said, look, I'm calling everyone and telling them all to kneel and say the credo so that we can all come together as a family. The next day, we went to the private audience, and I must say that I was very impressed because it was exactly the same uncle I had seen the day before, physically. But suddenly, he'd become another person. In our house, we have always focused our attention on the gifts of the Holy Spirit and His graces. And I said to myself, the Holy Spirit has definitely already changed him. As Pope, Paul finished the work of the Second Vatican Council and then devoted the next years to the colossal task of implementing its many reforms in the middle of immense social and political upheaval and during the storm of the sexual revolution. Certainly, this was the encyclical that made Paul VI suffer the most. I believe that one of the difficulties in the drafting of this document, now that we have clear information about it thanks to the opening of the archives, was that he was reaffirming the teaching of the Church and openness to life. But at the same time, he was enhancing the family context in human and anthropological terms. Already in 1968, when the encyclical came out, he understood that this context of openness to human life needed to be defended from the technological invasion that ultimately takes away the value and human dimension from the act of procreation. All those warnings have come true, just like his predictions that the modern world would be plagued by atheism, secularism, and materialism. He had taken the name Paul to embody his desire to be a pilgrim to all nations, and his papacy was noted for its then unprecedented travels. In 1964, he made a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, the first pope since St. Peter the Apostle to visit Palestine where he met the ecumenical patriarch Athenagoras I of Constantinople, marking the first meeting between a pope and a patriarch in 500 years. His apostolic journeys over the next years included India, Fatima, Turkey, Colombia, Africa, the Philippines, and Australia. In 1965, he became the first pope to visit the United States. In a famous speech before the United Nations General Assembly in New York, he called on the world no more war. War, never again. Jamais plus la guerre, jamais plus la guerre. Throughout his last years, he defended the true teachings of the Council and the Church's teachings on human sexuality, marriage, and human dignity. The Pope was saddened by the rejection of humanae vitae by so many Catholics and even priests and theologians, and he prophetically warned the world about the future consequences of a contraceptive culture. The descent of theologians and the departure of so many priests and religious took their toll, however, and in 1978 he was increasingly frail. Pope Paul VI died at Castle Gandolfo on August 6, 1978. Even in the midst of tiredness and misunderstanding, Paul VI bore witness in a passionate way to the beauty and the joy of following Christ totally. Today he still urges us together with the Council, whose wise helmsman he was, to live our common vocation, the universal call to holiness, not to half-measures, but to holiness.
Fittingly, the approval of both the beatification and canonization of Pope Paul VI included the miraculous healings of unborn children. A couple from the province of Verona, who were in the last phase of pregnancy with a baby girl, were told that she hardly had any chance of survival. The mother invoked Paul VI's intercession, and the little girl, despite all the unfavorable predictions, was born healthy. Today, she takes part in numerous conferences and gives testimony through her vitality. This message is not only about the holiness of Paul VI, who answered this family's prayers, but also about the value of the generation of human life for all of mankind. Pope, priest, and prophet, the teachings of Pope Paul VI have echoed across the pontificates of his successors, John Paul I, St. John Paul II, Benedict XVI, and Francis. In a few moments, we'll be back with more on Vaticano. More on Vaticano begins now. Oscar Romero was named Archbishop of San Salvador, El Salvador in 1977. He was known for organizing peaceful protests against the violent military dictatorship. As poverty and political turmoil grew, Romero began openly criticizing the arrests, torture, and even murder of clergy and laypeople at the hands of the government. Romero became a champion of the poor and encouraged people to offer their suffering to Jesus Christ. The preaching of Romero is a, a really a great example. Romero loved rich people and loved poor people. He wanted to unite them, not to divide. And in this current moment, where we see a great uh, abyss between uh, richest and the poorest, Romero gave to us an important message. On March the 24th, 1980, Romero was gunned down while saying mass in a hospital chapel. His outspokenness against the government had earned him many enemies. But the murder stunned the country, and 250,000 people attended his funeral. Romero was killed because he applied a church in dialogue with all people starting from the poor people. This is the point. Romero is not a politician. Romero is a pastor. He wanted to save or to help all Salvadorian people. In February 2015, Pope Francis declared Romero a martyr for the faith. He was beatified two months later in San Salvador, and now, nearly three and a half years later, one of Latin America's most beloved figures has become a saint. This uh, canonization is a great feast, not only for the Catholic Church. And in my experience, uh, I went um, in a, a lot of countries of the world. Well, in every country, I found a great admiration for this bishop. This is the pectoral, the cross of the Archbishop Romero. I was obliged to take the cross and the non-believers too wanted to kiss or embrace this cross. Because in Romero, also non-believers saw a great man useful for themselves and from the world.
Catherine Casper was born in Dernbach, Germany in 1820 into a poor family of seven brothers and sisters. After school, Catherine worked in the fields and her mom taught her how to spin and weave fabric, which became handy later on in life when she was forced to leave her home and work to support her mother and herself. The other children were drawn to Catherine's strong moral character. She invited them to a Marian shrine with her to sing and tell stories about Jesus and Mary. From there, her religious vocation was manifested. Catherine's fidelity and courageous yes to the Holy Spirit started the poor handmaids of Jesus Christ in a small wooden house with four other women to minister to the sick, poor, and children with a foundation in prayer and community. So my grandmother was, um, I, I believe, Blessed Catherine was her great, great aunt. And so that makes her my great, 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 great aunt, something like that. So my grandmother was a Casper. And so, you know, that's where it comes down. What inspires me is how she did so much with so little. I mean, she, she wanted to be poor. She was one of those crazy saints that prayed to be poor so that she could just give her all to Jesus. And, um, and so she trusted every time. And her story reminds me a lot of Mother Angelica. She died in 1898 and was recognized by the love and simplicity with which she served encouraging others to go forward in hope and joy, resisting the fears of the future. Today, the poor handmaids of Jesus Christ have built little houses in nine countries. Sisterhood has really just grown within the countries where we're present, and that's Germany where we were founded, uh, England, the Netherlands, the United States, and then Mexico, Nigeria, Brazil, Kenya, did I say India? We don't want to miss them. So um, internationally we support each other and we, our common ground is the spirit of St. Katharina Casper. Catherine was beatified by Pope Paul VI in 1978 as a woman of faith and fortitude. Her canonization was approved after Father Leo Prabhakar, part of the Congregation of the Brothers of the Sacred Heart of Jesus in India, was healed after a motorcycle accident. Doctors had declared him clinically dead after three days in a coma. So I became a small tool uh, for the canonization of uh, Blessed Catherine Casper. Really, I'm proud of it. Uh, wherever I go, whenever I meet the people, I proclaim the, my, the faith experience. Uh, it is uh, making the people to increase their faith, to make them too close to the uh, God. It's part of the excitement, I think, of the canonization is our coming together, but I think it's also the affirmation it gives us of how Catherine lived in a very simple way. She always wanted to listen to the will of God. Uh, for her to be canonized, that was nowhere on her bucket list ever. But that humility, that putting herself aside and always trying to do what God wanted her to do, that's what she models to us. And I think that's now what she models to our whole church. Stick around for more on Vaticano. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. Francesco Spinelli was born in Milan in April of 1853. His parents, Bartolomeo Spinelli and Emilia Cagliaroli, educated him from an early age to have charity towards the poor and the sick. When Francesco grew up, he was sent to his uncle, a priest in Bergamo, to study high school. After finishing school, he entered the seminary and was ordained a priest in 1875. In his first year of priesthood, he came to Rome for the Jubilee. Visiting the papal basilicas, he had a life-changing experience in the Basilica of St. Mary Major. Father Francesco knelt before the crib of the child Jesus, and during deep prayer, he had a vision of a group of young women who would adore Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament.
This was the spiritual experience that led him to try to found our institute. A few years later, he met Katerina Comensoli, a young woman who wanted to adore the Lord, and other young people who have followed this path. The first adoration started in 1882 in Bergamo, before the painting of the Sacred Heart. At that time, the Eucharist couldn't be kept in private chapels. And that's where the first three young women started the Institute, with an hour of adoration. However, on March the 4th, 1889, calumnies and plots forced Father Francisco to leave the Diocese of Bergamo and his Institute. He declared the bankruptcy of the Institute and was forbidden by his bishop to have any connection with the order. On March the 4th, 1889, Father Francesco appeared at the community of Rivolta Dada, penniless and betrayed by his own. How did he experience these failures? With the great suffering, but also with great strength. Don Francesco was a priest who was deeply in love with the Eucharist. For him, to celebrate and adore and spend those hours on his knees was to draw strength for forgiveness. La forza per il perdono. Here in Revolta Dada, the founder and his sisters found unity, strength, comfort, and peace, and soon after founded the Sister Adorers of the Blessed Sacrament. Nowadays, these works of charity consist of educational services, assistance and pastoral efforts. So we have schools, we have nursing homes, homes for the elderly. We're present in parishes and our communities also work with the new scourges that actually are not that new anymore, like drug addicts and single mothers. We offer all of them our help in Italy as well as in Argentina, Cameroon, Senegal and Congo. Ever since that time, Jesus has been adored in the Eucharist day and night in the Mother House at Rivolta Dada and in all the institutes around the world. St. Pope John Paul II beatified Spinelli on June the 21st, 1992. The miracle that opened the way to his canonization happened in Congo in 2007. A newborn child was injured and had an umbilical hemorrhage. The baby was brought to the hospital with a loss of blood and only an urgent blood transfusion could save his life. The vein could not be found, and at a certain point, the child breathed his last breath, and the doctor pronounced the baby dead, and then left the room. At that point, Sister Deline, who was in charge of the maternity ward, refused to give up. She ran home, lit a candle in front of an image of Father Spinelli, took one of his images with her, and returned to the room where the child was. She slipped it under his sheets, and then went back to the chapel to pray in desperation. Father, you cannot let this child die. And after a few minutes, a vein appeared provisionally, and the transfusion was made, and the child immediately recovered. The parents named him Francesco Spinelli, and today the child is 11 years old.